This is Module 5, Reconstruction and Post-Processing, Module 5A, CT Image Reconstruction. Image reconstruction by CT uses the measured projection data as input to calculate the density distribution of the desired cross-section and then displays the results for review. There are two general solutions for reconstruction algorithms. An iterative solution developed many years ago, originally called the ART algorithm or algebraic reconstruction technique, and the one that is more commonly used today, which is called back projection. CT scanner development depends upon essentially these two individuals, Godfrey Hounsfield and Alan Cormack. Cormack developed image reconstruction algorithms as far back as 1963, but Hounsfield developed the concept of CT imaging in about 1970, and both received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1979. Of historical interest, the company called EMI, Electric and Musical Industries Limited, was the original producers of the Beatles songs back in the 60s. They made so much money from the success of the Beatles that they decided to spend some of the money supporting research, and this included a research grant to Dr. Hounsfield for construction of the original CAT scanner, which was called the EMI or EMI scanner. The first scanner, which imaged the brain only, was installed in the United States by David King in 1973 at the Mayo Clinic. Its temporal resolution at the time was 20 seconds. The concept of back projection was first proposed to Hounsfield during a lecture in 1973 by Larry Shep of the Bell Laboratories in New Jersey, and then later was developed as a more commercially viable method than algebraic reconstruction technique. This is basically image reconstruction from projections. X-ray data are sent through the object of interest and the data are then incident upon a set of detectors which produce a particular density profile. Here's an example of back projection. If you have multiple projections, you can then back project the individual detector distributions onto image space, thus producing the image. The problem with simple back projection is that at the edges of each of these projections, there are some uncertainties as to densities. And when you then back project them, you produce a somewhat blurred image. So if I was to take a CT scan of a perfectly round basketball, the back projection would actually produce a spherical object, but with multiple spikes about the edges. The concept of filtered back projection provides a better way to improve image fidelity. Because there is uncertainty with respect to the edge and there is ringing about the edge, the application of a fast Fourier transform, or FFT, can be used, and this application is called a convolution or reconstruction kernel. Shown here then we take the original raw data and apply the filtered back projection technique using the convolution kernel and then we're able to reconstruct a set of images so when we take a CT scan of a basketball the projection back gives a black and white image of a spherical object. However, it takes many projections to be able to have this happen. A single projection is inadequate to produce a subsequent image. However, multiple projections along the way can result in very high fidelity. These data are represented as shades of gray on the subsequent image. The choices for which reconstruction or convolution kernel to use depends upon the object of the study. Different kernels are used to reconstruct data for different objects. If I wish to reconstruct images of a bone, I might want to use a high resolution or a hard kernel. 
The problem with this is, is that it has slightly more noise in the subsequent reconstructed image. Or I might consider looking at the adjacent soft tissue. With that situation, I can use a soft kernel, which smooths out the edges and produces less noise, but also has a difficulty with respect to absolute fidelity of the edges. Unfortunately, cardiac CTA is concerned with imaging high density materials such as calcium and stents that are immediately adjacent to low density materials such as non-calcified plaque or even lipid surrounding the coronary arteries. This is an example of how we then apply filtered reconstruction or kernels. Let's say that I wish to determine the density of a particular pixel or voxel called P. I must realize that this does not sit by itself but is surrounded by a number of other voxels of variable density. The smaller the number of voxels used in sharing in terms of defining the attenuation at P, the harder or sharper the filter or kernel. So if I only use the immediate area adjacent to P, I will get a subsequent density distribution that is very crisp with relatively crisp edges. However, the images are somewhat noisy. If I wish to then perform the same reconstruction but use a soft kernel, I can then use about P a large area of voxels that end up smoothing the result producing a much smoother image, but unfortunately less precision in terms of edge definition. So the differences between a hard and soft kernel are very subtle and are commonly applied when we're trying to decipher interpretations of various characteristics in cardiac CT angiography. Here's an example. Shown here on the left is a tomographic image of the heart at the aorta left main and proximal left anterior descending. You can see that the image is relatively smooth, but there is a stent in the left anterior descending and the stent itself appears somewhat blurry. If you ask the technologist to reconstruct the same data using a hard kernel, then you can see here that the image is somewhat noisier. However, the definition of the edge of the stent is much crisper. During evaluations of patients, it may be important to consider when there is a fair amount of coronary calcium or if there are stents present that the reconstruction of both soft and hard kernels may be necessary before you can complete your diagnostic evaluation. All of the CT numbers are then presented as Hounsfield units named after Godfrey Hounsfield or just simply CT density. By default the CT density of water is zero. The range of the presentations then roughly from minus 1000 which is air to plus 1000 which is dense compact bone. Thus you have approximately 2,000 shades of gray within any single image. A one point difference in CT value reflects a 0.1% difference in attenuation. The CT value of a tissue reflects the attenuation value of the tissue relative to water. So as you go about interpreting, it's very important that everything about CT is density in order to determine if this is calcium, if this is lipid rich, if this is an area of uh, contrast enhancement, all involves understanding the characteristics and ranges of the CT values. The CT value is the number behind the image. The brightness of the tissue in the image then is determined by the CT value and the window setting of the image, that is the area displayed in shades of gray on either side of the central CT density value. An object is visible in the image because it has a different brightness than its surroundings. So when we do 
CT angiography in order to be able to look at the coronary lumen, we need to enhance the coronary lumen by giving contrast and that allows us to separate the densities. Under ideal conditions, the human eye can distinguish contrast differences of about 1%, which translates to about 20 shades of gray, or in the world of CT, would be at best 20 Hounsfield units. Low contrast resolution is also very important. Again, as I noted, you need to be able to give contrast to separate the lumen from the wall of the vessel. Now, the differences between the two depends upon your contrast resolution. You can give very little contrast and still be able to enhance the lumen sufficiently to make a diagnosis. However, as the differences become smaller and smaller, it ends up making some problems with respect to your ability to perceive the edge. So as we go down in lower and lower differences between two objects, you get a difficulty in separating the two out. Now, the other important aspect is the single to noise ratio. In general physics, this is defined as the single strength over background noise. In CT physics, this is defined as the mean pixel attenuation value or CT density in the region of interest divided by the standard deviation of the pixel values or the Hounsfield units in the same region of interest. Shown here are some examples. For instance, let's calculate the signal to noise ratio of the left ventricle. In this particular case, the mean density is 334 Hounsfield units and the standard deviation is 29. Therefore, the signal to noise ratio is 11.5. For the same image, but in the right ventricle with less contrast present, the mean density is 152 Hounsfield units with a standard deviation of 27 Hounsfield units. So the signal to noise ratio here is only 5.6. In the same scan, we can also look at the coronary artery. Here, the mean CT density is 301 CT units and the standard deviation is 34. So the signal to noise ratio is 8.8. .8. In general, a scan is unreadable if the signal to noise ratio is less than or equal to 1. That is, the signal and the standard deviation are identical, and the images are somewhat tolerable at best if the signal to noise ratio is between 2 to 4. Anything above that value should result in a diagnostic examination. Noise is another very important parameter that interferes with the ability to define separation or define edge. You can see from this example that even though there is very low contrast resolution between the individual uh, holes here and the uh, resolution phantom, I can still detect down to the smallest ranges. However, as we introduce more and more noise, you can see that you start having more and more difficulty with respect to separating even the largest air lumen area from the surrounding noise. The minimum detectable signal to noise depends upon the size of the object. So the larger the object, let's say I'm imaging a left ventricular chamber trying to determine ventricular function. That is a large object and a lower signal to noise ratio will still allow me to assess its function. But in the same study, I may not be able to determine characteristics of the coronary artery because it is a smaller object. The more smoothing of the image can be done on the subsequent reconstruction images and it's very important to appreciate the differences between these two